Welcome to the fourth introductory lecture on corpus linguistics. The material in this lecture series is partly based on the book Exploring English with Online Corpora, written by Wendy Anderson of the University of Glasgow and myself here at the University of Macau. It's published by Palgrave Macmillan, and you can use it to follow up some of the activities or ideas that you find in this lecture series. Today we look at another powerful kind of search for collocations, that is, the particular expressions that regularly appear or co-occur in the context of other words and phrases. To recap briefly, in the first three sessions we covered the following issues. What are corpora and why do linguists find them useful? How do we search for the frequency of a particular word or expression in a corpus and how do we interpret frequency data? In the immediately previous session, we looked at concordance programs, which allow us to see words and phrases in their immediate context and to seek patterns of usage manually. We talked about sifting and hypothesizing, about large amounts of concordance data, and we thought again about how we interpret the raw data. And we've been familiarizing ourselves with some online corpora, such as the British National Corpus, BNC, the Corpus of Contemporary American English, COCA, the time corpus, and so on. Today we're going to look at a topic that is closely related to concordance programs, that is collocation. What is it? How do we measure it? How do we search for collocates? And how do we interpret collocation data? First of all then, what is collocation? Put simply, or reasonably simply, Collocation is a statistical measurement of the strength of likelihood or probability that expressions, words or phrases, will co-occur in a text. Usually, as with concordance lines, we're talking about co-occurrence within four or five words on either side of the search item or the node. It's quite important to reflect on this definition for a few seconds. We're looking at statistical ways of measuring the probability of co-occurrence of items. As we will see, there are different ways of measuring this probability. And we're not just talking about frequency of co-occurrence. Collocation is not just frequency of co-occurrence in a corpus. Although, as we will see, when we look at collocation measures, we should take frequency also into consideration. At some level, we all know intuitively from our experience of language what words and phrases are likely to co-occur in any given text or utterance. Members of the English speech community, for example, will have a good idea what words might commonly co-occur with fish or student, for example. What words would you expect to find in close proximity to those words in a text or an utterance? To explore this question for British English, we can look at the Brigham Young University BNC corpus. We log into the corpus and choose collocates from the menu. We then type in fish and set the number of words to four on either side of the node. This is the span that we're looking at. We could adjust this and just look at one word before or after the node, but we usually look at four words on either side of the node. We could specify the part of speech that we're interested in but we'll leave that open for now and just put a, an asterisk in the part of speech box. We'll sort our results by frequency, but we'll limit the results to a collocation measure, mutual information or MI, and we'll make that minimum number three. We'll come back to mutual information in more detail shortly, but basically an MI score of three or more means that the probability of the expressions co-occurring is statistically significant. Below three, the co-occurrence of items is probably accidental. The higher the mutual information score, the higher the likelihood that the items co-occur. Then we click Find Collocates. Well, surprise, surprise, if you're British at least, you'll have guessed that no doubt that chips is the most frequent collocate of fish, as in fish and chips, no doubt. In the corpus, the expressions actually co-occur 265 times, and there's a high MI score of 7.38. As you look down the results, you'll see other words that co-occur with fish. 
Fish co-occurs frequently with itself. For example, fish co-occurs within a span of four words on either side of fish. Meat co-occurs regularly, species, tank, and so on. And we see the results in descending order of frequency. Those were the parameters that we set in our query. If you look down the MI scores, though, you'll see that they go up and down. Species has an MI score of 4.07, but the less frequent collocate tank actually has a higher MI score of 5.46. What does this mean? How can you have a higher frequency but a lower probability of co-occurrence? Well, it means that both species and tank co-occur frequently with fish. But the less frequently found item, tank, actually has a higher probability of co-occurring with fish. Species is widely used with other expressions as well as fish. Up to a point, so is tank, but you're still more likely to find tank in close proximity to fish than species. When doing collocation analysis then, it's useful to have data both about the frequency of co-occurrence and the statistical measure of probability, something like an MI score. We can think of collocation analysis as a more statistical and comprehensive version of concordance analysis. Instead of looking manually at different concordance lines with student as the node, for example, to see how the node behaves in context, a collocation program searches all of the corpus and calculates frequencies and probabilities of co-occurrence of items. It's therefore useful to supplement concordance analysis with collocation analysis. Let's look at significant collocations of student, again sorted by frequency, in the BNC and COCA data available at the present time. As you would expect, the word student significantly collocates with similar expressions in both national corpora, British and American. Words like university, college, teacher, learning, graduate are both frequent and significant collocates in both corpora. A few collocates are suggestive of different cultures, at least during the period of data collection for the British national corpus. Oxford is prominent in the British data, and only in the British version is grants a frequent and significant collocate of student along, alongside loans, which appears in both lists. The collocates are then suggestive of cultural similarities and differences, although the presence of medical and nurses in the British data and their absence in the American data might be a consequence of the corpus design or the period in which the texts were collected. To review so far then, collocation is a statistical measure of the probability of co-occurrence of items, and it's calculated automatically with reference to the corpus as a whole and so it's a more objective and comprehensive measure than the manual analysis of a sample of concordance lines. To measure collocation, a program takes a given span on either side of the search item or node, say four words, on either side. The node can be a specific word form or what we call a lemma. A lemma includes in the search a set of related word forms, for example, singular and plural forms of the noun or different tenses or aspects of a verb. To search for a lemma using the Brigham Young suite of corpora, currently you put square brackets around the search item. Square brackets around terror, for example, would give you the singular form and the plural form, terrors. Searching for the lemma, terror, then includes both singular and plural forms of the noun. Here we can see that frequent collocates of terror in the British national corpus include rain, fear, and shear. If we look in more detail at the results of the collocation search, we can see that rain and shear are frequent collocates with very high MI scores, probably because of common expressions like rain of terror and shear terror. In fact, if we take a look at the co-occurrences of shear and terror, we can see that in 20 out of the 22 occurrences in BNC, shear comes immediately before terror, the node. Fear, on the other hand, is a frequent collocate and it still has a significant MI score, but it's slightly lower than shear and rain, probably because fear does not combine with terror in such a formulaic phrase and probably because fear co-occurs with a wider range of collocates. 
Looking at these figures, we can see something about what combinations of words and phrases sound natural in English and which sound unnatural. Sheer fright, for example, only occurs once in the British National Corpus and it has a fairly low uh, MI score when you take a look at the collocations. Sheer terror, however, as we've seen, uh, co-occurs 20 times in the BNC and it's got a high MI score. So what can collocation actually tell us? The collocations in a corpus, fairly generally, will tell us a lot about the patterns of meaning that a search item falls into in a given corpus for a given period. In other words, it tells us about the discourse of the item in that particular period. In the British National Corpus, which was designed in the 1980s and halted in 1993, the lemma terror has the frequent and significant collocates loyalist and the IRA, or Irish Republican Army. More recent data from COCA shows that the discourse around terror in America post 9-11 is much more about the global war against terror with networks, suspects, threat and plot figuring prominently. By now you're probably impatient to know how collocation is actually calculated. Well, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but as we've already noted, collocation is a statistical measurement of probability that can be calculated in different ways in a corpus. And it's worth noting the main types of measurement briefly. You'll see these different measures in different corpus and text analysis programs, so it's worth having a rough idea of what they do and how they're different. The main ways of cal calculating collocation end up with what were called MI or mutual information scores, which we've seen, and also T scores and Z scores, or if you're American, Z scores. All three ways of measuring collocation ask two identical questions. First, how many instances of the collocate are found in the designated span of the node word? That could be four words on either side of the node. This is called the observed. Secondly, how many instances of the collocate might be expected to fall into that span given the frequency of the collocate in the corpus as a whole? This is called the expected. Thereafter, the ways of calculating the probability differ. To calculate a t-score, you subtract the expected from the observed and divide the result by the standard deviation. In other words, you consider the probability of co-occurrence of node and number of tokens in the designated span. Obviously, if you change the length of the span, the t-score changes. A t-score of 2 or higher is normally considered a significant collocation. An MI score is a little bit different. To calculate an MI score, you again begin by considering the observed and the expected. But this time, you compare the actual co-occurrence of the node and the collocate with the expected co-occurrence if the words in the corpus were to occur in a totally random order. As we've seen in our online searches, an MI score of 3 and above is said to be a significant collocation, more than an accident. Finally, the Z score, or the Z test, is based once again on the difference between observed and expected. This time you compare the observed with the expected and calculate the number of standard deviations from the mean frequency. The higher the z-score, the greater the strength of collocation. Statistical formulae either really excite you or they leave you cold. If you're among the former group, you'll run away to the internet and you'll find more detail about t-tests and z-tests and mi-scores. If you're among the latter group, then the main message to take away here is that measures of collocation can be calculated using different formulae. So does it matter which one we choose? Well, yes it does. Because of the nature of the calculations used to determine the probability scores, each test has its strengths and weaknesses. The Brigham Young University corpora tend to use MI scores because they don't depend upon the size of the corpus. And so the MI score can be compared across corpora of different sizes, such as the BNC and COCA and COHA and TIME and so on. MI scores are useful in that respect. But you can't do that with T-scores. Some text analysis programs will calculate a T-score for you, 
But if you're comparing more than one corpus, and if they're of different sizes, then you have to look at the rankings of the collocations, the highest to the lowest t-scores, but you can't compare the absolute scores themselves. T-scores also tend to include more information about grammatical words, while MI and Z scores will downplay the prominence of common grammatical items. You may well be more interested in lexical patterns, what nouns and adjectives and verbs co-occur with terror, for example, and so MI scores and Z scores will be useful to you. But you might equally be more interested in the grammatical contexts of a search item, and a T-score will give you more information about that. The basic idea is that you should choose your calculation depending on whether you're comparing corpora of different sizes and whether you want to include grammatical words as well as common and significant lexical items. As we have seen, the Brigham Young University corpora use mutual information, or MI. To look in a little more detail at MI, we can go to the time corpus, for example, and run a search for the lemma terror following the steps shown on the slide. Go to the Brigham Young University uh, website, choose time, click on collocate, enter terror in square brackets to search for the lemma, put an asterisk in the collocates box, this is currently important, set the span at four and four, sort by frequency, and set the minimum MI to three. The results give us a lot of information to play with, including frequency, decade by decade, and an overall MI score. And if you click in one of the collocates, you can see the node in the context in a concordance line. As you can see, reign of terror is a common formula, as we've seen, with variations like reign of red terror in the examples. Note that these examples are mainly from the 1920s, not long after the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. So that's the context of terror here. So far, we've been sorting collocates by frequency and looking at MI scores, which though they're all set to three or more, and so are all significant, vary from higher to lower. It is possible to sort the results by MI score, known sometimes as relevance, keeping the results at a significant three plus. This will tell you the expressions that share the highest probability of co-occurring, no matter whether they occur frequently or seldom. Now, if we run this search with the time corpus, we find, at least at the time of delivering this lecture, that a series of very odd phrases such as mortal, Sophia this, 829, 90s height and Afghan trained, these are the phrases with the highest MI scores. Why didn't we spot these weird collocations before? They don't seem particularly interesting or helpful. Now this example teaches us an important lesson about collocation searches. If you look at the time corpus, you see that, for example, Afghan trained co-occurs with terror 100% of the time. The only time Afghan trained appears in the time corpus, it's in close proximity to terror. It therefore has a very high MI score of 12.6. However, since Afghan trained only occurs once in 100 million words, it's not surprising that it's got a very high MI score with the four words on either side of it. In short, unless we know how frequently an expression actually occurs in a corpus, we might be misled about the usefulness of the probability findings. We can compare the high MI of Afghan trained and its low frequency of occurrence with a high mutual information score of RAIN combined with a relatively high frequency of occurrence in expressions like reign of terror. Because you've got a high frequency and a high probability, you've got a much more interesting and useful pattern to look at. For this reason, when we're looking at uh, mutual information scores and sorting by mutual information scores, we might wish to set a minimum frequency of occurrence when we're sorting the data. In other words, by setting a minimum frequency, we can screen out those items that occur less than, say, 5, 10 or 20 times. So we can run the search for the lemma of terror again, but this time we can refine our search in two ways. First, we can limit the results to co-occurrences of nouns by choosing noun all from the part of speech menu. 
And secondly, we can limit the results to those expressions that occur, let's say, at least 10 times or more in the corpus. Now, if we run this search, a much more interesting set of results appears. Rain, as we would expect, is still very prominent. But then we have significant and frequent results for words like pity, torture and tactics, which seem to be more useful and common than the infrequent expressions like Afghan trained. Bear in mind, of course, that this is a corpus of written American journalism published between 1920 and the 2000s, much of it before the post-1911 war in terror, which probably changed the patterns of co-occurrence in the present day, certainly in American journalism. So the results will be influenced by the nature of the corpus, the period in which the data was gathered. But we also learn something, I think, about the general nature of the standard language. In this case, those co-occurring expressions like torture, pity, tactics and reign that remain frequent and statistically probable long term in the discourse around terror. So what are the take home messages from this session? First of all, statistical measures of collocation are a more objective measure of co-occurrence of expressions within a designated span than the manual reading of concordance lines, especially in a large corpus. Now, this doesn't mean that concordance analysis is not useful. Collocation analysis and concordance analysis are actually quite informative. They're mutually informative. We've seen that different statistical tests measure degree of association between collocates. We have the frequency of co-occurrence, co and then we have probability measures like T-score, MI-score, and Z-score. These different measures are good for different kinds of corpus and different kinds of word. For example, the analysis of collocation can tell you different things about the grammatical environment of an item, and you might want a T-score for that, or its lexical environment, an MI-score or a Z-score. The analysis of lexical environments in individual texts and larger corpora can shed light on recurrent themes that are important in a particular work, a group of texts, for example, disciplinary texts, or a culture as a whole. Finally, here is a summary of the kinds of things that you should be able to do as a result of this session. You should now be able to do the following. First, you should be able to search for co-occurrences of a word or a phrase. You should be able to choose between a specific word form or a lemma. You should be able to change the span in which the co-occurrence is found. You should be able to sort the results by frequency, perhaps setting a minimum MI score. Or, alternatively, you might wish to sort the results by mutual information and set a minimum frequency. You should be able to look at the results and begin to find patterns of co-occurrence, for example, in British and American English, or in and across different registers such as speech, academic writing, fiction, and so on. And you should be able to look at collocation patterns in different periods of time if you've got the corpus that can do that for you. Remember, more information about collocation and the other topics in this series of lectures can be found in Wendy Anderson and my book, Exploring English with Online Corpora. Thanks again for your attention.